Hi, I'm Ranjan Bhattacharya. Today I'm with Andrew Binstock, who's an auctioneer of many, many years. Uh, now, I always say that uh, you can go and watch a football match, and when people go and watch a football match, people concentrate on the teams. No one looks at the referee. Uh, and Andrew Binstock is, 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 is a referee of uh, property. How many properties have you bought and sold or, or transacted with over the years? I would imagine at least 10,000. At least 10,000 yeah. over how many years? So I started in, well, I started auctioning in 2006. So we're now in year 11 of me on the rostrum. Uh, and over that time, I must have conducted around 150 auctions. So. Wow. Um, so yeah. how did you get into it? How do you, how do you get onto the rostrum in the first place? <laughs> That's a good question. It's a bit like... It's a bit like how do you become a comedian or how do you become a TV presenter or any of these sort of, sort of rather unusual careers. Um, I was looking for some work in the property industry. I applied to a firm called Allsops and uh, they had some space on their graduate program. I just oh, left right. university and I effectively went on their program, stayed there for two years. Whilst I was there watching my old employers doing the sort of tricks of the trade on the rostrum, I thought that looked really fun. Sorry. Every year, Basically every year the auction industry puts on uh, an internal auction competition for members of staff that work at auction firms who are non-professional. So mm -hmm. not the people who are physically paid to stand up and do the auctioneering, but those who want to try it out and see if they're any good. And so I entered on behalf of the firm I was at. Uh, I did quite well and then I realised I got a little taste for it. I fancied doing it professionally. Um, where I was at the time, it wasn't, you know, my progression as a, in the career there was not going to allow me to get on the rostrum. Um, there were some very senior people way ahead of me in that food chain. So after a couple of years, it became inevitable that I would leave and then try and start my own auction business, which I did. Um, and I got together with a chap in Liverpool who I'd only met by complete chance. He ran Sutton Kirsch mm -hmm. and Sutton Kirsch became Sutton Kirsch Binstock with me involved. Um, we set up a branch down in London. Um, unbeknownst to me at the time, the goodwill that Sutton Kirsch had in Liverpool didn't necessarily carry across into London. And over a period of a few years, as we sort of found our feet in the sort of a very competitive world down here, um, eventually the rebrand came along. I had a new business partner come in, yada, yada, yada. And eventually we became Auction House London, yes. where we are today. And that's the, 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 the abridged version. <laughs> <laughs> OK, and you do seven auctions a year, isn't it? Is seven seven few, auctions in London, seven in Liverpool, and then lots and lots of charity and corporate ones throughout the year as well. So um, you see a lot of people um, come to auctions and uh, a lot of people bid on stuff that they haven't even seen, um, no due diligence at all. What would you recommend that people watching this um, should do in terms of due diligence when they are, uh, before they bid on an auction property? Wow, that's a good question. So um, exactly like you just said, there are people who buy blind. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. if you've got the confidence and the money, go for it. But the, a prudent buyer will not only see in the catalogue what they like the look of, they'll go and see it in person. You will go and inspect the house or the flat or the garage or whatever it is you're going to buy. Once you've seen it, you like the look of it, it still ticks the boxes. Then, of course, you have access to a legal pack. Mm. Most auction companies will allow a free, da free download of this legal pack. And again, it's up to you. You either read it yourself if you feel competent enough or you would pass it to a solicitor to read on your behalf. At that point, you will then hopefully become aware of any problems that are associated to that property, maybe additional charges, or maybe there's an absentee freeholder or something that, that you may now want to step away from. So we'll then lose another wave of people at that point. So um, by the time that process has happened as a prudent buyer, you've seen it, you've been through the legal pack, you're aware of any potential problems. Now you've got to get your finances in place. Um, you will need a 10% deposit for the mm -hmm. auction itself. That has to be in cleared funds. That's not something you can sort of borrow against. If you're buying a £300,000 lot, you need to have access to £30,000 there and then. Yes. If you're the winning bidder, you will at that point put down that 10% deposit and any buyer's uh, premium to the auctioneer. Uh, and then traditionally, you'll be given 20 working days or four weeks to come up with the remaining 90%. People are under the misconception that you always have to be a cash buyer. That's not the mm -hmm. case at all. And there are plenty of opportunities to get finance in the auction world, whether that's through bridging or whether that's through just normal, bridging, ordinary um, bank finance. Yes, yes. So, you know, it's not the case that you have to have all the money. There are, it's a much bigger audience than that. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much, it's a simple very transparent transaction. It's very um, transparent and open these days. Yeah. Now, th in the catalogue, when you describe a property, um, am I right in saying that um, basically, uh, as auctioneer, you're responsible for whatever you describe a property to be 
just the words in that catalog, anything that's not said is up to the buyer to check out and fully investigate. So that's why you just say three rooms. You know, uh, you, yes and no, yes and it's no. Up, every, it's up to the buyer to check out everything. You're absolutely well. right. So basically, um, in terms of our description, I wouldn't quite go as far as to yeah. make sure we got the descriptions as, as correct as we can. And if we're reliant on other people to feed that information to us um, and it transpires that that's incorrect, then, you know, we've got a slightly grey area. But generally speaking, we carry out viewings. Mm -hmm. So even if the published catalogue is wrong, and that does happen, of course, you've described something as a three bed um, house. And when a bunch of people go through the door, they ring you up and say, you know, that's only two beds, right? Um, and then, of course, we change it. That's called an addendum. So there's, it's very important that a buyer reads the addendum to any uh, property that they're mm -hmm. bidding on because it will have those changes. And they always, always come to light. So it's very unusual for us to incorrectly describe a house and it stays incorrectly described the whole way through the process. Um, the, yeah, the nuts and bolts of it are, we try not to be too over descriptive because we don't want to say the wrong thing. And most of the properties that we take on, we're dealing in huge volume. We haven't been to all of them prior to going to print. Um, so we're not going to say it's a 40 foot reception room. We have no clue. Um, obviously, if it's already been on the market before or the vendor is very sort of determined to tell us exact information, then we might say double bedrooms or a single bedroom, whatever it might be. But if we, if we don't know, we won't say. We'll just say, like you said, three bedrooms upstairs and a bathroom. Two receptions in the Ooh. kitchen downstairs. Please go and have a look and check it all but out. Sometimes yourself. it says not internally inspected. Absolutely. As a, as a description. You've article. got to remember we live in an internet world now where information on properties is really easy to find. So even if I haven't been in it, none of my staff have been in it, even if the vendor only last saw it six years ago, chances are the sales particulars from when that person bought it are still online somewhere. And we can go into an archive and see from even up to 10, 15 years ago what the property was originally described as. And if the vendor says, all I've done is put a new kitchen and a new bathroom in, the rooms are still exactly the same, then we do have that information. Once in a while, you will come across a probate. It's not been touched in 50 odd years and literally nobody has seen it. And then you would literally say, we don't know what it is yet. Yeah, Sorry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so what's all this bidding off the chandelier about? Well, that's very, that's very dramatic. The, the use of chandelier, I would say, is, is not relevant. It's, all it's, LED yeah. lighting these days, light, light, Any bidding, lighting bidding object. Off the LED yeah. light, yeah. <laughs> uh, bidding off the wall is a, is a practice yeah. a skilled auctioneer will do, and they will do it, hopefully, in a way that doesn't create any obvious um, observations from the audience. We are entitled, as auctioneers, to bid on the seller's behalf up to but not including the reserve price. This is completely uh, legal, above board. You know, people think it's not, it is. Um, what we're not allowed to do is bid past the reserve price or even on the reserve. That, at that point, um, we are now at the mercy now, of the room. I've noticed um, that when you actually re reach that reserve price, yeah. there's some code words that you use, uh, not, uh, not just you, but at the auction industry, like, um, I'm going to sell or um, we're going ah, to sell it today. Okay, I mean, so, what, what yeah. What code words do you use? Well, I would suggest, I would suggest tell that... Tell people that the reserve's been met. Well, a good auctioneer probably won't say anything at all because the oh, last right. thing you want to do is alert people to future lots where you haven't met the reserve. My oh, okay. job is to try and um, get the bidding to a point where every single property sells. Mm -hmm. Some won't, as you know, you've witnessed many of my auction rooms and sometimes the reserves don't get met. But only a, a sort of a rather amateur auctioneer would, would ever let that be known to the outside world. I mean, you know, my job is to make it look like we're going to sell all the time. And if we don't, then we declare it the very last second. So I might say, you know, first time, second time, third and final time sold and we have sold it. And I might go through that exact same wording and process and not sell it. Um, we're not allowed to lie. I'm not allowed to say it's sold if it hasn't yeah, and vice yeah. versa. But um, to say, oh, right, come on, I really need some more bids. Otherwise, I'm not going to be able to sell. It's, 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 yeah, pretty, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's pretty poor practice, I would suggest. So the, um, now, a lot of people uh, talk about bidding strategies, and you must hate the guys that uh, turn up and put their first bid in when you're saying uh, <laughs> it's going once, it's going twice. <laughs> uh, yes, I think, I think, look, we live in a world where everyone watches um, so Homes Under the Hammer and Air Hunts and these sorts of programs, and, and people are under this illusion that for some reason you'll get it cheaper if you wait till the last second, which of course is not the case at all. Um, it'll always go to the highest bidder, however long they delay their bid. The, uh, the truth of the matter is there's a very short period of time and I will sort of do exactly like you just say, first time, second time, and then the hand goes up for the person who's sort of been waiting to the last second and they feel that they've got some sort of advantage by waiting that long. They haven't, they've just delayed the process ever so slightly and then I will invite the underbidder to come back in and I will always give that person the same amount of time as the slow person. So look, 
as I always say to people on auction, um, the, 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 we will always extract that final bid. No one's going to sort of be chopped out of the process. Yes, yes, yes. Um, if something's worth 312,500 pounds, it's going to go for 312,500. I, I don't care how long they take to do their bids. Now, a common thing I've heard from people who have never been to an auction before, um, they, you know, they, they, there's this perception that, you know, you're sitting in the back, you're scratching your nose, and you've sudden, suddenly bid for a property. I mean, that obviously doesn't happen. Of course does it? it doesn't. Although what you've touched upon is, uh, is something that a lot of us auctioneers will do if we see somebody who's clearly not bidding because they're waving to their friend mm -hmm, mm -hmm. or they're trying to get a phone signal or whatever it might be, then there's always a nice opportunity in a four hour, you know, it's quite a, a long day to pretend you've taken a bid off someone and then watch their sheer shock and horror as they <laughs> wave frantically trying to undo the bid that, you know, we're obviously only interested in genuine bid, bids on that lot. And if someone's genuinely, you know, waving at a friend, it's fun to say, oh, I'll take that bid. And then they, they, they get hysterical and then of course we retract it. But um, yes, as a general rule of thumb, don't come to an auction and start waving at random people in the room because clearly I mean, that's conversely, often. it's hard because some people like to be very discreet because sometimes I try to observe who's bidding mm. and they're just, you know, discreet wave of the catalogue yeah. and it's, no, that's, it's, it's, it must be hard I would say 90, 99% of all bids are done with a tiny little look like this. Now, Eye contact, is it? Tiny. Mm -hmm. Now, what we always say is bid clearly for your first bid. So the first one, I need to see you. Yes. But yes, once yes. I've seen you once, yes. now I know who you are. So I want to know you're here bidding. So um, if you prefer to go into TV mode, you know, with a little one of those or a little <laughs> not, no problem. Once I know where you're sat, um, but obviously, you know, don't make your first bid that because chances are you're not going to get seen and then don't come complaining if, uh, if the auctioneer didn't see you. Hopefully there's four or 500 people in the room and there's only one of us. Um, even with some bid spotters, it's hard to see the tiny little... Well, then, you know. <laughs> now, finally, I mean, um, uh, what's been the, I mean, out of the last 12 months, what's been the sort of standout um, entry in your catalogue that you wish you'd been in the room on and bid on yourself? <laughs> such a mega, mega deal. Well, let's just put it out there. I would never, ever buy or bid on anything in my own auction yeah, no, room. I, mean, yes. um, I would say the, the sexiest lot we've ever had happened to be in the summer of this year, which mm. was a probate house in St. John's Wood, which we sold for three and a quarter million pounds, which is still a record for under the hammer price. Um, and that had obviously an enormous amount of attention, press, um, it was an untouched house in a prime, prime location, had been in the same ownership for decades. Uh, and that, that was a very enjoyable lot, you know, that was a real standout from a typical auction instruction. Um, but, you know, we sold bits of grass for a pound before, so we, we have everything. There's no, it would take me a long time to go through yes, every single yes, interesting yes. lot we've had. But. I mean, it's interesting what people are selling in your sale as well. I mean, um, airspace and also yeah. um, mud below the ground correct so this is really common now freeholders have now latched onto the fact that there's value in the air above their buildings and in the gravel below uh, and you know britain's a f an island with a finite amount of space and people are now tapping into this concept that um, there's development below and above and and yeah some smart guys out there are, are making a lot of money in selling those spaces and there was this consultation uh, paper earlier this year about making upward development, one floor, yeah. uh, part of permitted development. They haven't reported back yet, but if that reports back positively yeah. next year, that will be a bit of a gold rush. It will. There'll be all sorts of people suddenly realising that they've got value in that space. And, and we've seen lots of, you know, office to resi permitted development schemes and people just try, you know, look, property is, is, is obviously one of those industries where lots of people um, see it as quite an easy industry to sort of yeah. get into and, you know, events like this, educate people who, you know, might not want to be doctors, and, but you can earn good money in property. Mm -hmm. And, and in, in seeing that little angle and just working out something that somebody else might not have spotted, that's how people do well in it. And yes. I guess roof spaces and basements is, is, is typical of that. That's what it's going to mm. all be about. Listen, Andrew, thanks very much. Uh, cool. Andrew's going to be giving a full talk here tonight at the uh, Baker Street Property Meet. You can catch Andrew at Auction House London uh, property auctions. We also do a networking event at, at uh, Auction House London Sales, which is the Property Coffee Morning. You can find out about that at propertycoffeemorning.com and uh, come and join us. Come and join Andrew at uh, one of the forthcoming Auction December House. December the 13th is our last one this year, so come to that yes. one. <laughs> okay, speak to you soon. Bye for now.